so going back to your career then, you, how, how many, um, what do you call them in the Navy? Tours or um, assignments? How many did you do before you went to Top Gun? Well, in terms of, let me see, I was um, in my first tour when I went as a student. So I joined, uh, I joined a squadron that was deploying to the Mediterranean as a first deployment to the Mediterranean in a VF-14. And we came back from a, that deployment and uh, went on a small, a, a short other one. And then I was selected to go to, uh, to the school. And at that point, the, the squadron supported the pilots going through the school with airplanes. So we'd, we'd send an airplane, a detachment, of maintainers, and uh, I, I went, and my sister squadron, the F-32, went with an airplane, and we were the first F-14s to go through the school. This was in 1975, and it was, uh, it was a, it was a great opportunity. Um, it, they didn't necessarily know what to do with us. The school didn't because you know it was a new airplane, and we didn't know what to do with them, and you know, we were trying to, we were, we were both instructors at Top Gun and the F-14 side. We were both sort of seeking out the best of tactics and what we could do with the airplane. And so it was an experiment for both sides. Uh, it was interesting that there were only, there were three squadrons that had participated in that class. There was only six of us. And there were uh, two F-4s from the Marines, two F-105s from the Air Force, which is another interesting airplane, and us. So it was a very odd group uh, going out, trying to do you know, different kinds of fighting. The, uh, the F-14, in, in, you know, we took it, it took all the, the stores, rails, and everything. It was a slick airplane. So it was very relatively high performance. And... Uh, very maneuverable, uh, and, you know, high, very high, good angle, high angle attack qualities, uh, very good slow fighter. And, uh, you know, its negatives were, it was a big airplane, so it's easy to see. And it, uh, at range at this point, the engines would smoke a little bit. So you could, you know, if you're at 20, 30 miles, you end up with a sort of a smoke trail that wasn't helpful, uh, but you weren't going to hide. So it was, it was us big airplanes, pretty maneuverable versus F5s, uh, A4s, very small airplanes, which were hard to hard to keep track of. Um, and the airplane would would do very well in a in a relatively slow speed. Anything 350 knots and below, it, it was a pretty good knife fight between the A4, the F5, and the F14. And it, uh, they they all had great attributes and. Uh, you know, had, we had good fights. Most of those fights were at medium altitude. So um, the, the A4 didn't like to fly up at high altitude. The F5 could, but it wasn't necessarily. And then the, so this was, you know, sort of the 15 to 25 range. And within that, uh, the performance of the airplane was really quite exceptional. So you've described sort of high, high angle of attack performance uh, as one of the qualities. Can you, for, from a layman's point of view, ex explain aerodynamically what made it good at 350 knots and below? The, the wings would program based on Mach number. So if you you went up very high, the, uh, you'd end up even you know 300 knots or whatever, you'd end up with the wings all the way back because it was trying to be supersonic. It was designed to be uh, an interceptor. So it was trying to go fast. Um, if you tried to maneuver at very high altitude with the wings back, you 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 had some challenges because uh, uh, the it became a big delta wing airplane, and uh, we had quite a few high altitude, uh, high relatively high angle attack engine stalls that that led to uh, spins, flat spins, and so we we had a, a quite a few high Hot, you know, uh, spin issues, spin incidents with a fair number of lost airplanes based on the fact that the airplane was at high altitude trying to turn, one of the engines would stall, and the airplane, uh, the pilot would try to correct, you know, for the stall, and he would put rudder opposite that particular, and you'd, you'd induce 
uh, a departure at high altitude. Um, and so I don't, you know, the, the airplane, when you got down below 30, you got into 25 and below, the wings started coming out. And, and now you had a very high wing loaded airplane that was, uh, that had slats and maneuvering flaps and, and very large stabilators that could grab a lot of air in the back. And so you could, you could really pull the airplane around. Um, and it had very good, uh, flying qualities at slow speeds. So the, um, you know, large rudder, uh, inter, you know, two big rudders, uh, big stabilators. There was no computers telling you what you could or could not do, like in the S-16. So you could, you could, you could do maneuvers in the airplane like a pirouette, which is you go up, uh, you go up slow speed and then almost cross control the airplane, uh, back down the same, uh, flight path. And you could go up and just turn around and come back down by departing the airplane essentially. Uh, in a controlled way, so you could do a lot of maneuvers that that you couldn't, you can't today do in an F-16 or in a probably in an F-15. I, I don't know that for sure, but you had a, we had a manual uh, flight system that was totally con controlled by the pilot, and there was nothing telling you what you couldn't do. So the airplane, um, if you got in a slow speed fight with somebody, it was usually a a pretty good fight to the death. Um, and we, we had a lot of that. So that's, that was our, that was where we had an advantage and that's where we tended to fight, to fight. Probably everybody listening to this will have seen Top Gun. Um, they'll, they'll know that Top Gun is about training the best of the best. Um, but what was it really about? What, when you, uh, when you arrived in 75, what, what were they teaching you that you were not getting in a fleet squadron? And I've had to try, you know, regress just a, a hair to say where, the state of training was say in 73, 74, when I joined the squadron, there, there really wasn't a syllabus per se that was going to take you from one point to another in terms of combat training. It was, uh, you had a flight lead, you're in a section and he was going to hear, he was going to teach you, you know, the, the way of the airplane and the way they were going to fight. Uh, it was very personal. And then you had a, a, a a wide range of flights that you would go out to do in training intercepts. You do some electronic warfare. You, you'd go out and every day you'd try to do some air combat maneuvering. Uh, and how you were trained uh, to do the air combat maneuvering part was very much uh, akin to who was your flight lead, you know, what, what they do, how they uh, knew to fight uh, the airplane. And so, the, the training ended up being kind of pickup. I mean, you know, didn't have any real formal status. It's not structured the way, the way it is today. And, and uh, there, there was no real progression available to get from here to there in terms of in improving yourself. Uh, so when, you, when you, you go into the Top Gun environment, they're, they're, they become much more structured in terms of, okay, we're going to do – uh, ground school, 1v1, 1v2, 1v many, 2v2, 4v4, and then and we're going to have specific uh, objectives in every flight. We're going to have very intense debriefs. We're going to go through everything that happened in a lot of detail. We're going to go through all the gun film. We're going to go. We're, we're going to take apart every flight. And so, what might have been a 15 or 20 minute debrief in a squadron ended up being two or three hours. I mean, intense desire to pick out everything that somebody did right and, and did wrong and in a very non-personal way, but it was just, um, it was business. It was, this is serious business and we're going to spend the time that we have here intensely trying to get better. And that, that was, that was interesting to me. I mean, it was, uh, it was a little bit of a shock almost, you know, that, that uh, well, we're not going to go to the club. You know, we're going to we're going to actually sit here and talk about this. Uh, but it was it was a, it was an attitude that uh, just okay wasn't okay, and that if you really wanted to be better, you had to work at. It. Uh, that was one of the the tremendous insights. Uh, the second part of what I learned at Top Gun was the staff, being that Top Gun was was kind of empowered and looked upon in a very positive way through the chains of command. 
uh, didn't mind asking for things. And so when they when they had a problem or the, you know they they found a challenge, they really went through the chain of command and said, "We need to do. We need this. We need this. We need this. We need gun cameras. We need uh, more of these tape recorders." And and they really forced themselves into a better training scenario, a training situation, right? So they they demanded the best. Uh, better equipment. They demanded better representation and and support from this this whole structure, the whole training structure, and that, and they got it. And, and and then they used it well, and they produced great outcomes. Um, and so I think that you know it's sort of not only the mindset that you have to train, you have to work at this, but the other mindset is that that don't just say don't just take no for an answer. Go out and make it happen. You know, go. You know, go to the next level, be a bit aggressive, and, and get yourself the, the, the requisite capabilities and, and support that you need to train. Um, and, and that's, you know, it was really the, the genesis of the air combat maneuvering range initiatives that really transformed the way we train in, in fighter training. Uh, it was, it was, it forced a lot of improvements in systems, weapon systems and reliability. And it was really kind of a, it, it was a, something I took back to my squadron, which is you just don't roll over and say, you know, okay, that's okay. This, this isn't, this isn't right. We got to go do something about it. Uh, the other obvious great thing about Top Gun is as a student is these magnificent instructor corps that were all uh, awesome in terms of their their own professional credentials, their own their own way of uh, dealing with training and, and interpersonal skill sets. They they always wanted to bring the best out of you. They were positive and they they but they were quietly you know in their critiques. But they they their mission was to make you improve, and that was that was refreshing. It was like going uh, you know to a spa and have somebody really worry about you, you know, and, and, uh, you know, they were focused on, on making you better. And that was, that was really a, a, another thing that I took away as something that this is, we need to inculcate this, inculcate this into the entire adversary core. You know, that you're here not to beat this person. You're here to make them the best person that they can or the best team. Um, so I, again, I had, had a great experience at Top Gun and I, that was my first experience going up to the desert against the MiG-20, MiG-17 in this particular case, uh, which is something that was a marvel. You know, we wrote about, it, you wrote about it in the book, a marvelous, marvelous opportunity. Um, and then we we fired missiles, shot guns. We had a lot of maintenance problems, some of which we ignored, and uh, maybe broke a few rules. But uh, again, it was. Um, I got critiqued for a 12 G gun run at one point. So, uh, <laughs> how did that go? Well, I, I, my, my going away gift, you know, at the end of the course was, a uh, was a gun sight that went between your knees, uh, because the, I had called a gunshot on a guy, you know, at some pretty incredible G level. And he said, that's where the, that's where the pipper was when you shot me. You know, <laughs> it was down between your knees. So it uh, again, it it was a great experience, and I have those friends forever, almost. I mean, they're still. We just had the 50th reunion, and uh, wow, really a bunch of Type A personalities in the same room, but th just unbelievable. If you just go out and work on excellence continuously what happens it's just amazing so i always took that along with the rest of my career that uh, you can be good if you want to be you just got to spend the time to do it and 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 want to be good and better than the others that's just not a yeah you, know, you just have to want it so you, you went you went back to to be the ceo the, the commanding officer of the squadron in 1990 then how had it changed or had it changed i'm making the assumption it had Oh, uh, well, honestly, I went back through as an instructor in 83 on my way to Nellis because I was the Top Gun representative at the 4477th. Uh, so I went through the instructor course at that point, and it was, you know, it was meticulous. Uh, it was uh, intense, and it was very critical. I mean, they wanted 
you to, as the instructor, you know, to know and do your, your best training uh, efforts. And so the, I would say nothing had changed in terms of the attitude. Uh, nothing had changed in terms of dedication to excellence, all, all the above. Uh, that was true when I went back in 90. Uh, the same 25 best pilots I've ever seen, all dedicated to uh, almost, obs I wouldn't say obsessed, but they, they sought perfection in, the, in everything they did. Uh, and I, to potentially an excess. I mean, we had some eight hour debriefs that I thought were maybe excessive. Uh, I mean, and with the advent of, of a lot of the technology to capture uh, gun camera, you know, gun camera film, you could, at that point, we were data tracking all the radar activity, all, you know, everything you did in the airplane was being recorded and uh, so much more opportunity to go back. And, and, um, and so, the air combat maneuvering range, if you did a, like a 4x4v4, four four, four you'd go and do the 4v4 four, four debrief, and then the sections would break down and, and do, you know, a 2v2 two two kind of thing, and then you'd break it down to individuals. And so you went through a whole cycle of trying to go, go back and get the most out of the data. Was there any, any sense then... I mean, maybe if we, again, if we keep it sort of as far in the past as possible, it's a, it's an easier question to answer. But let's say when you were going through the Red Eagles or, or prior to that, that there were other nations who had similar programs, so threat nations, adversary nations who had similar programs who were also figuring out the same stuff. I mean, there's, I guess there's a, an inclination, isn't there, to sort of live in your own little echo chamber where you think, well, we, you know, we're the best, we're the West, we know how to do this better than anybody else does. And of course, the Soviets had this doctrine of, of close control on GCI. And, you know, you, you saw in, in Southeast Asia, the, the North Vietnamese Air Force makes just make these sort of slicing attacks. They didn't stay and hang around generally. Um, but was there a sense thing as you were going through Top Gun or you know, sort of in that time frame, that other nations were beginning to develop the same sort of awareness, the same sort of levels of sophistication around air combat training and understanding their adversary and the threat. Yeah, so you'd have to go around the world to, in, in Vietnam, I mean, the North Vietnamese had uh, a certain cadre that were released to fight if they wanted, you know, if they could find uh, a target and engage it, and they were pretty good at it. And so they, they had a, an element of first you have to be allowed to do that. Um, and then you have to practice it. So I think some of them were, were fairly good at it. Uh, the, the country that really, that I grew up with uh, ad, admiring was Israel. And they, they'd gone through, you know, three wars fighting. Uh, a lot of it was fighting MiGs with F4s or, you know, airplanes that, that didn't necessarily match up very well, but they did very well. I mean, they, I met one general that, that was like, he was in a fight with 19 MiGs and, you know, he was just by himself and, and it ended up shooting several of them down. And you, so their, their training program and their, uh, their approach to training was very aggressive. That's the Israelis. And they became very successful at it. I think that's true today, you know, with that same sort of mindset. Now, uh, I'll tell you some, I'll, I'll tell you, and this is probably when I was the CO, we used, we used to go and do uh, exchanges with them, with the Israelis, and we'd find out, you know, what's going on well and what's going on bad. And so within an exchange I'd had, uh, maybe 10 years ago, 10, 10 years before 90, so it was in the 80s, with the Israelis uh, and, and trying to glean their training approach and, and uh, what they were really doing to become so good in terms of kill ratios and such, uh, really had a lot to do with their, their merit system. So if you looked into the the way they trained, they had a they had a command level, you know, a chain of command in terms of who was running the squadron. But the they went out and fought each other and kept track. And the really really good pilots went to the top of this ladder, and they were the most prized 
you know, they were the winners of this sort of uh, ranking. You know, they weren't in charge, but they were the best. And so uh, it, it became, you know, it, it became apparent that that motivating folks to have this to be better was a positive. In other words, that, that you could get a, a positive outcome just because someone wanted to raise up to the top of this ladder. So the, the, the ladder approach uh, was effective in increasing the overall readiness of the squadron. Now, I'll give you a couple of, a couple of anecdotes. Uh, so we had a, a, an exchange tour come, I think, in the 1991 time frame, and, and they had uh, had a whole raft of F-16 accidents where people had lost control of the airplanes and they were they were literally atroph you know, atrophying their force based on losing safety, you know, safety related losses. And so when I looked at the, I looked at their concept and our concept of training, it became almost kind of obvious that the fact that we had gone to a third party instructor corps, not fighting each other, so the, so the Top Gun pilot instructor is there to school and and motivate and bring the best out. Uh, but if he gets killed, it's not a big deal. I mean, it's not the end of the world, right? Whereas on the Israeli side, they go home, you know, they get points for winning and no points for losing. And they their actual uh, position within the squadron is determined by, by the outcome of these fights. So now you... you Think about that. These two uh, Israelis go out to fight, and they know that there's going to be a winner and a loser, and the loser is getting no points, and that's going to impact uh, their position within the squadron in terms of uh, who they are and and who's going to get you know picked to fight. So the so what becomes apparent then is that this third party adversary who's not who's invested in a good outcome, but is also responsible for safety, who is also responsible to make sure that, that, that you don't go below the hard deck, that, you, that you're not performing the airplane beyond, uh, you know, be, beyond its capabilities, uh, that that has a real strength in and of itself. Because the Israelis had to stop fighting each other at a point because of their losing so many airplanes. So I, I, when I told them you know, about our adversary force, and they, oh, you know, what a luxury. Uh, but, but the adversary force is a key to being able to train because they, they, they allow the safety environment to happen that is acceptable. Where, and so you can go out and, and train really, really hard against the best adversary force, and, but you take the who out of it. And then when you come back down and land, you know, your, your job's not dependent on it. I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's a whole different mental dynamic that that is is really excellent. Um, now I'll give you another example of the same Israeli problem set. They had gone to where they they had a couple of mid airs and uh, in intercept flights and and had, had other collisions in their little range off the west coast of, of Israel. And so they had gone to really severe block altitudes for their uh, intercepts and really limiting, especially at night, um, what, how they were going to set things up so they didn't run into each other. So we took these, these folks up to, to Fallon and showed them a uh, 36 plane, complete go for it, uh, with no block altitudes and, and all on the air combat maneuvering range with safety observers on the ground being sort of the third party uh, the third, the third party safety people. And, and we let him, you know, we ran that whole thing and the, and the guy was mystified. He, he said, I, we could never do this ever, you know, certainly not at night. Uh, and, and look at what you can do here. I mean, it, it, it's the technology. Uh, it was the, the whole, the whole mindset that you're going to go fight, but somebody, somebody sort of neutral party has to be, able to knock it off uh, if they're if it gets out of control right and and that's the instructor's role both on the ground and in the air um, so that in many cases the americans in that later 
80s, 90s, became better fighter pilots than the Israelis. And it was mainly because they had the ability to go out and, and fully train against really, really good instructor in, in really representative airplanes, uh, which is a luxury. But to me, it's the essence of success for, you know, for at least the U.S. Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps in terms of going forward and safely uh, training people where you're not losing a bunch of airplanes and you're not destroying them and, and, uh, and you have a real dedication to, to specific mission objectives on each flight and then and you spend the time to go through and debrief. So it may be longer than, uh, than you wanted, but it's, it, it was eye opening to me to think that the Israelis had had to downplay, down tune their training because of some of those factors and, and the, some of the technologies and uh, policies that the United States was using was actually helping them get better at the same time. The Israeli problem is, is really fairly small. I mean, it's not, it has limitations where the longer the range missiles don't help you because if you have to shoot somebody when they're over Israel, you're already in a short, uh, you, the range, if you wanted to shoot somebody over Syria, or I mean, that, and that happens, uh, you'd have to, the range is so confined that, that the limitations end up um, being to where you need to go be offensive. And they, their biggest successes were when they were fighting in somebody else's country, uh, you know, big sweeps into Syria or e, uh, Egypt. But they didn't necessarily, a lot of that didn't apply to what we were doing uh, at Top Gun or within the fleet training, uh, the fleet training world, um, they're they're fighting defense. I mean, they're they're on defense from the beginning. If they're fighting to defend Israel, so they they have to fight on the offense if they're going to be successful because that's the only way they get any range uh, to implement the higher tech weapons. Um, so it's a, it's a different problem set. My first job in the Navy as a flag officer was in Washington, D.C., and I was in the aviation procurement branch as a deputy. So we, we were in charge of buying the new weapon systems and pursuing new technologies, spending money, um, finding the next best, best thing uh, on the aviation side. So I'm still very much involved with Top Gun because they they are also sought after as uh, subject matter experts for the next threat and for what we need on the U.S. side. So the, the same I was working with the same people, assessing what kind of capabilities we wanted to buy uh, in the next generation airplanes. And so beyond that, I went to. Um, I went out to command a battle group, which was as a carrier, an air wing, and eight ships. And so I was still involved with the carrier and the air wing, uh, and I was still able to fly with them. And 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 that um, that was great. And I I was able to bring some experience, but also flying when you can fly or operate with someone, you you get to know who they are and whether they're any good. I mean, it's fairly quick. So even as a, as a senior leader of that group, you, there's nothing like going out and flying with people to find out if they know what they're doing you know, or if they have their, where their mind is in terms of learning how to train. Is there a lot of pressure on you then to do that? Because the one thing that the other thing that you hear, you know, it's a common theme regardless of which community it seems you speak to is that, you know, flying fighters is a young man's game, um, you know, young woman's game um, nowadays too. Um, so, so as an admiral, um, you know, one or two star, if you're going to jump into an airplane, is there a lot of pressure on you to not embarrass yourself? No, not really. But, so when I was a, a deputy wing commander, I flew seven different kinds of airplanes. As a wing commander, I flew seven. I flew three of those off the ships in Iraq. Uh, and and the older you get, the the more proficient you you get in terms of managing stress. So in other words, if you've been there, you've done a lot of this stuff, and you you are um, 
you're proficient in a, if you're proficient in F-14, you're probably proficient in a lot of other airplanes that don't have the same kind of performance. Um, and, and so I don't, I would never, I flew F-18s. Uh, I never had a problem with being, and again, it wasn't necessarily me versus anybody else per se. It was more me being um, uh, a counselor, helper, you know, someone trying to make it better. I wasn't out there to, to kill any, you know, to beat anybody up. I was there to try to and make them better. Same kind of philosophy, I think. Um, and I don't, you, yeah, you, you don't, you don't want to embarrass yourself, but at the same time, they, they, if you can go out and fly with someone in their airplane, you're leading by example. I mean, they, they respect that, that you took the time to go learn, had to go through all this training to learn their airplane, to go out and help them uh, find it, you know, find the best way to fly, fly their airplanes. And so uh, it, it was nothing but positive, you know, in terms of uh, overall impact, I think. And you had, you had to be careful that you didn't screw up. I mean, that you could end your career with a bad landing somewhere. I mean, you know, you could, you could not perform your own, in your own way and embarrass yourself. But so that was probably my worst nightmare was, you know, doing something nefarious in a landing pattern or something. Did you fly combat in Iraq then? We flew combat missions. This is during uh, Operation uh, Southern Watch, where we would we would go in for two hours, two or three hours, and uh, um, we were getting shot at, and we were on. You know, we were always trying to get the Iraqis to come down and and play. But uh, 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 it, I mean, I wouldn't call it super shooting war, but it it was. Uh, it was it was just part of a drum beat of us pressurizing, keeping pressure on Iraq. Um, so it wasn't a free lunch. How many hours did you get in the uh, in the Tomcat? Well, I had had uh, almost four thousand, and um, the majority. Well, I had probably thirty eight hundred hours in the Tomcat. So I, it was you know I I had. I deployed nine times and I, and I flew Tomcats in almost all of those uh, uh, deployments. So I just, you know, I spent most of my life in the F-14. Having described then how you, you go initially from this analog aeroplane through, I guess you're talking about the D model, which has the electronic flight control system and everything's digital. Which was your favorite? Well, the B model which was a an air, it was an A that they all they did was put new engines in it and some upgraded a little bit of upgraded uh, data bus, um, but it to me it was it was the A which I loved to fly and but the problem with the A was the engine and so the B model had the 110 engines in it and wow I mean it, it was dramatic to see uh, what you could do with 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 that extra thrust so we had a we had a situation where we had a in the in the air wing I was in we had a squadron of, of a models and a squadron of B models and they were they were swapping airplanes around and so we all went to deployment at Fallon with both types of airplanes and we flew them in mixed sections and the, the perf- it was just unbelievable the, di- the difference in performance. Uh, we'd do a strike uh, strike profiles, and the A's would be an afterburner, and the B's would be in you know something below m- military power. And the, you, uh, we were starting to fly with bombs on the airplanes at that point, and the B's could come in at uh, you know at 500 feet and just explode into these 30,000 foot uh, bomb patterns. You know that that the A, you know, wasn't able to do. So you had a fuel efficiency, you had all this better engine technology. Um, and, and I cannot, um, the F-14A just had a real problem with stalls, engine stalls, and the engine stalls, uh, well, you know, 
led to quite a few uh, lost airplanes. And so the, you're always fighting the A around the engine and trying to keep it keep it from stalling. And if it, uh, you know, if it if it did stall and you had to stop and you know try to get the engine going and, and the whole thing. In fact, I had one day where I was chasing a Libyan MiG around uh, off the coast of Libya, and, and it was a um, MiG 23, and it was he was on a training profile out of uh, out of uh, the training base, and it came up and we intercepted them, and they looked over at me, and you know I looked at them, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, the guy got visibly uh, upset and turned on, you know, put the afterburner on and started to take off. And that, so I shoved ours in the afterburner and the left engine stalled, big flame coming out the front of it and the whole thing and had to shut the engine down. So I'm chasing the guy around with one engine and the other one had shut down trying to get the other one started again. You know, and it's just part of the deal, you know, it's like, uh, Par for the course, you know. It's so it, the the D, the B model all had this 110, and you could uh, you could almost do anything to it in terms of moving the throttle around, and uh, and it wasn't a big deal. So I don't. Uh, when I went through as an instructor in the F-16, they come back and they they debrief me and they say, Skipper, you got to. This is when you should have gone to idle. And I said, Oh, you know. I can't get high G getting, you know, going to idle in the F-14 and boom, you know, it, it was a, it was going to be an automatic stall scenario. So I, I just, you know, I said, okay, I'm going to have to get myself to do that. Uh, go, you know, I have to learn not to get out, to get out of this training mode that I'm putting myself in that, you know, you just don't move the throttles if you're at a high altitude, high, high angle attack. 